because they've been treated like dirt often um, by priests. There are snide remarks made in homilies. Um, and, and, you know, and they're fired. I talk about that in the book. I think that's uh, completely unjust. It, they really, I mean, I say in the book, they really are treated like lepers. But, um, they are the most marginalized group in the church. Yeah, I think the, the, the group that would probably parallel them would be women. You know, many, many women feel marginalized for a number of reasons. But, you know, at the Vatican, you have International Women's Day. You, you have, you know, women serving. You, you don't have International LGBT Day at the Vatican, which kind of maybe Yet. draws some smiles. Yet. Yet. Um, that was before you were an yeah, advisor. Well, <laughs> that's right. Yeah, we'll see about that. So I wanted to put the, the Bible passages that I have found in my ministry with LGBT people to be the most helpful. You know, one of them is Psalm 39, you know, which I, I find very helpful in, in ministering to people. And um, I quote at the beginning of the book, for it was you who formed my inward parts. You knit me together in my mother's womb. I praise you for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. So there's a sense of kind of you understanding yourself as wonderfully made. So I know there you, you, you talk about there's a lot of LGBT Catholics who are, you know, not struggling with this identity issue. They, right. They're in the church. They're, but what would you, I mean, we've got, a, I'm sure there's a listener that is very much struggling with this right now. So if you could... Which, and they are confused, they're struggling to find their own place, even their relationship to God, let alone the church. Do you have anything to say to them? Of course. I have a lot to say. Uh, I believe it. A whole <laughs> yeah, book, in fact. A whole book. Um, God loves you, first thing. God loves you. God made you this way. You are wonderfully made, just like Psalm 139 says. You were knit together in your mother's womb this way. You know, it's a mystery why you were made this way, but this is part of your identity. You're baptized, you know, you have every right to be in the church, uh, as does the Pope and me and your local bishop. Don't let everyone ever tell you that you're not, you don't belong in the church. You have every right to the sacraments, you know, and can you find a place that's going to welcome you? You know, if you're struggling with, uh, sort of feeling like the church is rejecting you, try to find a place that is not rejecting you. Um, try to find people who are going to accept you as you are and who are going to celebrate your gifts and and treat you as the beloved child of God that you are. Um, and that, that's, that's essential. There has never been definitive scientific evidence which proves that those who experience same-sex attraction were born that way. According to the most recent pronouncement on the topic from the American Psychological Association, there is no consensus among scientists about the exact reasons that an individual develops a heterosexual, bisexual, gay, or lesbian orientation. Although much research has examined the possible genetic, hormonal, developmental, social, and cultural influences on sexual orientation, no findings have emerged that permit scientists to conclude that sexual orientation is determined by any particular factor or factors. Dr. Simon LaVey, a neurobiologist at both Harvard Medical School and the Salk Institute, who dedicated most of his career to finding the missing gay gene, once said, a person's sexual orientation is not necessarily a fixed lifelong attribute. Sexual orientation can change. Dr. Richard Isay, a psychiatrist, psychoanalyst, and gay rights advocate who is instrumental in changing the way the mental health field approached the LGBT community, had to admit that the majority of gay men, unlike heterosexual men who come for treatment, report that their fathers were distant during their childhood and that they lacked any attachment to them. Reports vary from my father was never around, he was too busy with his job, to he was victimized by my mother, who was always the boss in the family, to that of the abusive, unapproachable father. You mentioned the different ways that LGBT people have been mistreated by the church. Um, but I assume that there are parishes or individuals who are making or are out do outreach to LGBT people. Are there any examples that come to mind that have been especially good? Yeah, that? absolutely. Um, I mean, the one that comes to mind that's nearby is uh, Church of St. Paul the Apostle, which has a group called Out at St. Paul's. There's Most Holy Redeemer Parish in, in California, St. Francis Xavier in New York. Uh, out at St. Paul is a gay affirmative outreach located at St. Paul the Apostle Church in New York City. Via social media, the group has promoted everything from gay saints to an outdoor mass at the site of the Stonewall Riots in honor of gay pride. In 2015, they launched the Owning Our Faith video series, in which several members of Out at St. Paul share their testimony 
including a same-sex married couple, who believe that by staying in the church, the LGBT community will eventually compel the Catholic Church to change its teachings. If we leave it, if we abandon the church, then it's never going to change. Yeah. So we have to continue living here and being an example and encouraging other people to be that example because that's what's going to change the church. The Parish of Most Holy Redeemer in San Francisco has perhaps the longest history of gay dissidents in the Catholic Church. According to the official history of the parish, written by Jesuit Donald Godfrey, is it less appropriate for gays to imagine Jesus as gay than for African Christians to picture him as black, Asian Christians as Asian? When Gramic spoke at Most Holy Redeemer, Godfrey described her argument. Whenever our conscience goes against the teaching of the church, there is a tension, but it is a healthy tension. We know that the development of doctrine does take place over time. And as we know, doctrine has developed over time, for instance, with regard to slavery. Once we believed that the earth was the center of the universe, it took our church a long time to recognize that truth. Revelation continues down the centuries. Gramic struck a chord for many of those listening in the church, for many at Most Holy Redeemer remain good Catholics and at the same time dissent in conscience from church teaching on certain issues, including on homosexuality. That there are loyal Catholics who dissent in conscience, as at Most Holy Redeemer, is what allows theology to grow. The parish of St. Francis Xavier, also in New York City, offers a yearly Pride Mass to coincide with the New York City Gay Pride festivities. On June 27, 2015, the day following the Obergefell decision which legalized gay marriage in the U.S., the parish posted an image of the altar covered in the rainbow flag. Um, so you've been around the rodeo before, so you know what's coming. <laughs> <laughs> you get to canonize another person. <laughs> well, who did I canonize last time? Jean Vanier? Jean yeah. Vanier. Jean Vanier. Mm -hmm. um, oh, this is great. <laughs> I'm going to canonize Sister Janine Gramic. Okay. Who is the co-founder of New Ways Ministry. And let me tell you, uh, you know, like, you may be too young to remember all this, but, uh, you know, in the 80s, they were really under a microscope. Yes, we are too young to yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> In the 90s, having the 90s, uh, Cardinal George uh, in Chicago said they couldn't call themselves Catholic. Um, it was really severe. Um, and, you know, she persisted. And, and you know, one of the amazing things about receiving this award was to go down and, and give this talk uh, and see people from, from that generation, from the generation of the 80s, um, and also to see people from your generation and younger. You know, there were people from high school there. So here's this woman who has really struggled um, and has really fought and has really advocated at great cost, you know, within her own church. And so, yeah, I'd put her up. Uh, I don't know. I haven't read every single thing that she wrote. Um, <laughs> but, um, yeah, I'd put her up for, if not canonization, then at least servant of God or beatification. Along with Father Robert Nugent, Sister Janine Gramic founded the Gay Affirmative Catholic Outreach and New Ways Ministry in 1977. Almost immediately, the group's wide divergence from official Catholic teaching caught the attention of concerned prelates in the United States, and the Vatican began an investigation into their published work and unusual pastoral practices. In 1984, both Nugent and Gramic were ordered by the Vatican to step down from leadership positions at New Ways Ministry, but both continued to speak out against church prohibitions concerning homosexual activity. In 1992, they co-wrote and published the book Building Bridges, Gay and Lesbian Reality in the Catholic Church. Here are some excerpts from those essays written by Gramic. An obvious function of the genital organs is reproduction, but to maintain that a particular bodily organ serves only one purpose or must serve a certain specified purpose seems provincial at best. A positive and affirming lesbian gay theology or spirituality rejects the notion that a homosexual orientation is abnormal, sick, sinful, or criminal. The 1986 letter from the Vatican's Congregation for the Doctrine of the Faith 
which contended that a homosexual orientation was objectively disordered, obviously did not begin from the experience of being lesbian or gay. Such experience confirms that a homosexual orientation is not contrary to nature, but is part of God's plan for creation and essential for developing the human family. Without the presence of lesbian and gay people in the world, reality would be truncated and humankind unfulfilled. Lesbian feminist theologians are exposing the limitations of a procreative sexual ethic and are suggesting instead an ethic based on mutual relation. Same-sex couples have a greater potential for modeling this ethic than opposite-sex couples who are often subtly saddled with societal conditioning to conform sex role stereotypes involving dominance and submission. A lesbian gay spirituality or theology begins with the individual's encounter with God. It is not necessary that God's presence be mediated through formal religious structures. In their personal encounter with the living God, lesbian and gay people must read the scriptures in the light of their own experience. In his ministry of teaching and healing, Jesus challenged the authority of the religious leaders of his day by the witness of their lives of faith, responsibility, and love. Lesbian and gay Christians similarly reject traditional teachings regarding the moral status of homogenital acts and thus threaten the authority of contemporary religious structures. Domestic partner relationships with the legal rights and benefits accruing to same-sex couples have been acknowledged by several large cities in the United States. These societal developments portend a future conducive to spiritual and theological change. Only when lesbian and gay persons have been accorded full and equal respect and dignity as human beings in society and in the church so that they are no longer categorized as inferior insiders or outsiders, will the Christian community be able to say that the god of heterosexism has been eradicated. In 1999, the Congregation for the Doctrine of the Faith issued a notification regarding Sister Janine Gramic and Father Robert Nugent. Both were permanently prohibited from any pastoral work involving homosexual persons. Gramic ignored the notification stating, I choose not to collaborate in my own oppression. In 2010, the USCCB, then headed by Cardinal Francis George, issued a clarification on the status of New Way's ministry, stating, No one should be misled by the claim that New Way's ministry provides an authentic interpretation of Catholic teaching and an authentic Catholic pastoral practice. Their claim to be Catholic only confuses the faithful regarding the authentic teaching and ministry of the Church with respect to persons with a homosexual inclination. In 2012, Gramic publicly spoke out in support of the State of Maryland's same-sex marriage referendum, or Question 6, which narrowly passed with 52% of the vote, thus at the time making Maryland the eighth state to legalize gay marriage. Gramic was also present when then Maryland Governor Martin O'Malley signed the legislation into law. I'm very saddened that some of our church leaders have claimed that marriage must be between one man and one woman. That the definition of marriage has always been the same, that it cannot change. Well, this is simply not so. In 2015, Gramic publicly supported legislation legalizing gay marriage in both Ireland and the United States, stating, You can be a Catholic and vote for civil marriage for lesbian and gay people because it is a civil matter. It has nothing to do with your religion.